down a little bit. Let's see. Okay, I think I can. I think, yeah, I'll just. No, that's okay. Good. That that's good. That's good. Okay, we got it. Okay. Do you edit this? Then? Oh, uh, for for my for the website, we usually just use a chunk of it oh, consecutively. Okay. Okay. It's a kind of a reporter's notebook to say this is the conversation. This is the article okay. that came from it. Okay. It's a, it's a special feature that we can offer get people to click into the website. I wanted to ask you a historical question, because I, I am a great fan of The White Rose and also of this film. Is this a singular or unique occurrence in that part of German history? Did, did The White Rose constitute something pretty much singular and unique, or were there other comparisons, and this is merely the one that's talked about a lot? No, there were others too. So um, there was a Red Chapel uh, there was a Red Chapel, there were uh, some religious priests like Bonhoeffer, there was Elsa, what is also mentioned in the movie, he tried to kill him already in 38, and um, no, there were students, there were religious people, of course, much too little, of course, but it was not only the White Rose. Now, you're, you make emphasis in your film about her religious convictions, which are not, which are Protestant and fairly fairly conventional, I think, but it did give, apparently give her some strength in this, at this time. Talk a little bit about that, because it, it appears from what you've just told me that a lot of the opposition to Hitler that existed was religiously oriented. I mean, there, there was a, that was kind of a counter, there was a, if there was a counterpoint in the society, it was partly religious. Um, they were educated in a religious way, not in an extreme religious way, um, but to, to believe in the good and in God. So they were believers. And um, in the research, I found out um, that the hangman who executed them was a German hangman in the eighth generation. He killed, there's a biography about him, he killed 3,000 people. And it's quoted that um, he said from 3,000 people, he never saw people going that free, proud, and upright towards him and the guillotine like the members of the White Rose. Um, so this was clearly a, a strong motivation to, for me to find out what kind of people were this? These young students, 21, 22, 23, um, who were so strong to go this way to the guillotine towards their death with such an attitude. That was a very strong motivation to find out for me. And another strong uh, motivation, of course, was to find out um, what was motivating them to distribute the leaflets. Um, uh, if you read the six leaflets, you can read it in the internet in all languages. It's an unbelievable work what they did. And Sophie Scholl was not writing the leaflet. It was the teacher and the male students, the brother. The brother was the head of the White Rose. She was distributing the leaflets. And for me, it's important that Sophie Scholl was not the head of the White Rose. She was just, a, uh, uh, I think, also the only female because the boys didn't want to uh, endanger women. But she wanted to do something against Hitler. And um, I found out how important the education was for them, the ed education by the, by the parents. The father was a mayor. He incited once Hitler as a, uh, a bad guy, and he went six weeks to prison. The mother was a children's uh, nurse, and so they educated their children um, against all powers, go free and upright through life, even if it's difficult. And they were educated um, towards empathy and curiosity. And um, so the education was very important. And the boys of the uh, White Rose were medical aides at the Eastern Front. They were eyewitnessing the mass killings of women and children. And they reported it to Sophie Scholl. She stayed in Munich and, and went on studying. She was not eyewitnessing the mass killings, but the boys were. And they reported for, uh, to her. And I think so the knowledge about the crimes, about the murders of women, children, Jews, and for no reason. Um, so the education, the knowledge, um, that was motivating them to fight against injustice with a word, not with a weapon, to try to open the eyes of the people, of the students in their university, um, to make the people think, to resist in a passive way, not to help the Nazis anymore. And I think the belief in God, that gives them, of course, also the strength to do it, to take the risk, to risk their life. But I think the content of the, uh, of the leaflets, that's more about uh, the, the basic rules of living together. You know, 
whether you are religious or not or left or right wing no you have a, you have to have a basis of the living together of human beings freedom of speech freedom of religious religion uh, every human life is sacred so the first articles of the law nowadays in germany um, because Hans and Sophie Scholl were Protestants. Christoph Probst was Catholic. Um, and uh, they were all different uh, religious uh, uh, educated. But what combined them was the fight against a murderous system, the fight against injustice. That was what combined them. And the belief in God gave them the strength not to take the offer to work together with the Nazis. To say, I, you are a murderer, I don't take an offer from the murder system. I prefer to go to death, I love, uh, uh, and maybe my death will, uh, uh, will motivate other people to rise. But not to accept the offer to save your life by a murderer system. To give you the power to go to hell. She consoles the mother. Don't cry, we see us in heaven. Life goes on. She consoles the mother. That's an unbelievable thing for me. So I think the belief in God really helped them um, to, to stay strong and to not accept the offer and to go to the death in this way. Now, the specific interrogation by that, uh, by that constable, that uh, police interrogator, who talks about his own class origins, is this all come, does this all come spe specifically from documents? Do we know this is exactly what happened, or is this imagined from, from, from things that you can pretty be pretty safe to sure did happen um you know the white rose is germany's most famous resistance group there are two other movies about the white rose and we have 190 schools named after sophie scholl and other hundreds some hundreds named after other members of the white rose the the place in front of the university is called the geschwister schollplatz and um in the schools they teach about german resistance they try to teach the Nazi time um, out of the perspective of the resistance fighters because I think it's a very intelligent way to teach young people nowadays, um, the, uh, people like Sophie Scholl, how did they see uh, this Nazi time? Why, did they were why were they fighting against uh, uh, the Nazis? So I think it's good for the pupils nowadays to identify with Sophie Scholl about this civil courage uh, thing, about empathy, curiosity, and to uh, have a filter something or a help to, to, to have a look at the Nazi time at the mass murders. Now, <clears throat> comparably in this country, Martin Luther King Day is Monday, and uh, there were white people who were involved in the civil rights movement, but they certainly weren't a majority. And uh, the bulk of the country, as we well know, was passively supportive of racial segregation and Jim Crow and worse, of lynchings and other things. And it's, a, it's an episode of our history that we're going through now because we're learning more and more and more. Uh, just uh, they're now talking about the North Carolina government where blacks were overthrown in 1898 by a white coup and basically murdered. You know, a very Nazi-like activity. So we're having to come to terms with that. And we realize that the majority of white citizens were not on the, on the side of the right side. Talk a little bit about that in terms of Germany, because the majority of Germans were not, uh, were not on the, the side of the white rose at the time. What the people who lived right after the war, who had been involved with the Nazis in one way or another, how did that attitude change? How did this White Rose thing, and because especially with the older people, it had to be very conflicted and very guilt-ridden. Um, my grandmother was a Nazi too. She was a sports lady. And her, the dream of her life was taking part in the Olympic Games in 1940. And the Nazis sponsored her. She was a champion in athletics. They gave her money. And she enjoyed her life, she was training, she was not interested where the money came from. She didn't want, she was not interested in politics in the background. And she, she said, Heil Hitler. She was a, a, a yes woman, a follow woman, you know, saying Heil Hitler. And the majority of the Germans were not murderers. Let's say we had, of course, millions of murderers, terribly enough. But the majority of the whole people was guilty for not wanting to know about what was going on. They were yes men and follow men, they profited. And I think this specific view on this different kind of German characters is very important. And um, the majority of the yes men who were maybe not murderers, they refused to talk about after end of war to their children and grandchildren because of their bad conscience. I asked my grandmother, I inherited the medals with the swastika. She was not talking about her Nazi time, not at all. She was not a murderer, but she, the bad conscience was so strong, you know. And um, 
also the relationship between my grandmother and my father. My father, he also wa always wanted to know something about this time. He was born 44, but they refused to talk about him about it. So this is the reason why Michael Verhoeven did his movie The White Rose in 81, like the Nazi movie, anti-Nazi movie The Tin Drum. It's also for Volker Schlöndorf. So this is a perspective on the uh, parents' generation. And I, now the new generation, we have a perspective and questions to our grandparents' generations because they didn't tell us something and now we want to know. And I'm maybe one uh, uh, the last direct uh, the generation who can still ask eyewitnesses. You know, the sister of Sophie Scholl is 85, you know, um, and now to the, to the interrogation officer. That was the reason why I gave the second main part in the movie to the Gestapo interrogation officer who was a yes-man, a follow-man. He was guilty, but he was not a murderer, you know, and he stands for the majority of the Germans. They were guilty for not wanting to know, for helping the system, for following. And um, this begins in the time of the First World War, when Germany was depressed, mass employed, occupied, and there was no politician who gave hope to the people, and then comes Hitler, and promises good thing, work, proud, social welfare, and they vote him, and then he abused them, and then they profits, and then they didn't want to know where it come from. They have the evil, the Jews, you know, and um, all the, I think, 95% of this interrogation in between Sophie Scholl and Robert Moore is true is out of the documents, word for word. And the reason why I did the movie was because I learned on the first page Sophie Scholl was lying, pretending she's innocent. I'm not involved in this. I, put it, I pushed it from the balcony, but I didn't lie them there. And in Germany, she's seen like a heroine, almost like a martyr. But there you see she's a human being that fights for her life, even almost betraying the idea to say, I'm innocent, I'm not involved, I'm not political. Yeah, almost, you know, and she spent three days with a Gestapo officer, and after three days, he tries to save her life, and she says, I don't regret, I would do exactly the same, it's not me, you have the wrong ideology, and I will take on the consequences, you know, and this unbelievable emotional journey of two different German characters in three days, this is the heart of the movie, of course we have all the distributing in the beginning of the movie and uh, with Steadicam in the original location, the, the, the pupils are in the classrooms, they're running through the university, you know, it's, a, wow, it's on a high level of adrenaline, you know, what a risk to, 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 to distribute leaflets calling for the death of Hitler or for the fall of Hitler, you know, and at the end we have the show trial, that is also true because we not only found unpublished documents, question and answer with the, hand, with the signatures, we found documents and reports about the trial and even execution reports. The Germans were stopping from opening the curtain to head of eight seconds. They were quoting the, the shout of Hans Scholl, long live freedom, you know, so even execution protocols. And I was also the first because I was so much interested, what kind of character is this interrogation officer who after three days of interrogation tries to save her life? And then I was the first who found the son. And the son is also 85. He is the same age like Sophie Scholl. And he gave us, after two months, we were looking through all the phone books. Nobody was interested in this guy. And we found him. And he was telling us all about his father. He gave us all the photos. Um, in the movie of the White Rose of Michael Verhoeven, it's, uh, the interrogation officer is a guy with a gray beard about in the 60s. In the White Rose, it's Hans Scholl who accidentally pushes the leaflets from the balcony. In our movie, she is doing it intentionally, enthusiastically. And um, our uh, interrogation officer is 44 years old. And the son was very interesting because on the one side he was ashamed that his father was a Gestapo man, a Nazi. He was somehow, of course, responsible for the death of Sophie Scholl. But on the other side, he knew the French found out he was not a murderer. And he tried to save the life of Sophie Scholl. And that was true. So it's a very ambiguous interview with him. And the last thing, um, uh, also the, 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 the son told us, um, to this time, also the son was not believing in the final victory. He told his father, I don't want to go to the Eastern Front. And the father said, I'm a Gestapo officer. You have to go to the Eastern Front. And the son reported us about his bad conscience to send his own son to there. So because also the father obviously was doubting whether the final victory is possible. Eight months of air raids from the West Allies, the loss of the Battle of Stalingrad, you know, and you send your own son to the Eastern Front. And he had to go. So this was also very uh, interesting. And there I understood 
what kind of character this Robert Morgai was. He was a family man. He had an own son. You know, he had feelings. You know, and he's a human being. But he was um, a coward, and he was he profited from the system. He was a small little country policeman, and by the uprise of the na Nazis, there's this all bureaucratic stuff. He climbed up the the career, you know, and he didn't want to know the the bad things. He he had a great life suddenly, and so no, this is all true. This is all true. I can say. Um, <clears throat> Sophie Scholl in your movie has a has a cellmate who is a communist a communist woman, and uh, of course, in the nature of a fiction movie, we're not quite sure can we trust her or not. Is she perhaps a secret plant by by the Gestapo, and the, which is always a possibility? But she turns out to be a, a true friend. Talk a little bit. Is that historically accurate too? Um, this is all also exactly like the Robert Morgan, hundred percent true. This lady wrote a fourteen-page letter to the parents of Sophie Scholl, that the parents know exactly how Sophie Scholl spent the last days in the cell. So there, if Sophie Scholl in the movie has emotions or cries, the motivation and the timing of the tears of Sophie Scholl in our movie is out of this letter. When Sophie Scholl quotes her dream, it's word for word out of the letter. So how we chose the words, original words for the interrogation, I chose the original words and the motivation and the timing of the, emo uh, of the emotions out of the uh, letter of the summit. And I met the nephew of, the, of uh, Else Gebel. And um, she was sentenced for one year because she had also leaflets, but uh, literal uh, leaflets who made fun about Hitler. You know, so not calling for passive resistance. They were making fun of Hitler. And she got one year, and they, she was an educated. She could work in the in the with all the in the archive. She was educated for working in the archive, so she helped them, and that's the re And she got better food and a bigger cell. And um, also, Sophie Scholl doesn't know whether she can trust or not. But Sophie Scholl is not telling her things that could be in, for, uh, interesting for the Nazis. And she and the one or two questions when the cellmate asks Sophie Scholl something, she doesn't answer. So, you know, um, and I met the sister of Willy Graf. It was another member of the White Rose that got executed. And the sister of um, Christoph Probst, who was the third one who got executed. Both 18-year-old girls spent four months in the same cell, like Sophie Scholl, with the same cellmate. And the sister of Willy Graf was interrogated four months by the same interrogation officer. And she was one of our most important eyewitnesses. Um, because she told us everything about the cell, about the cellmate, about the uh, 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 about the setting, about the table, about the Robert Morgai. And um, Willy Graf, in '43, told his little sister, you are the one who should keep my remembrance alive. Since over 60 years, this woman travels around Germany from school to school and tells her story and the story of the White Rose. So she was uh, our most important informer, let's say. So also this story is 100% true in the cell and the character too. How do you cast this film? Who do you find? Um, I, cast, I did cast it like all, I, I cast all my other movies. I have a very good casting director. And of course, everybody in Germany knows the photos of Sophie Scholl, also the photos of the judge. We have three hours. The only character where we have original film is the, uh, the the judge they filmed another trial with hidden cameras they hit the cameras in the swastikas and we have three hours original material and they wanted to screen it to the germans to deter from resisting but they made a, a test screening and they learned this uh, uh, movie deters from the judge so they went back to the editing room tried to edit him off stage they made another test screening and still the shouting is so strong that the people are still deterred from the judge. So they never screen it and they hide it somewhere. That's the reason why it's still existing. And um, we know many photos and also at the end of the movie you see all the, all the photos are all the original young people in the nature, open air, enjoying the life, loving the life, original, the original characters. And so um, I told, of course, the casting director, the, the, she, she must have, the age must be somehow uh, the, the right. The, she, they, they should look somehow alike, the original ones. And then there were about 10 Sophie Scholz and 10 uh, 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 interrogation officers, and I'm so glad. I, and then I invited them five, six, seven times to check out what's our personal 
uh, 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 level can we talk can we talk about this topic what's how's the, how's the approach of you to the story of Sophie Scholl how's the ability to show uh, to learn a lot of dialogue and to, to, to bring the original work up to life because the movie the main part is the original word and the second main part is the look into the eyes of the one of the best actresses of Europe she won the German actress she won the Silver Bear the German Film Prize and the European Audience Award and the European Academy Award. And the audience has a look into the eyes of this actress who brings up these words alive. And that's an unbelievable thing. Yeah, one of the things I noticed as the film progresses in the interrogation, her eye contact with the interrogator becomes more and more significant. In that sense, it becomes a play, really. That that part of the film is like a play. You could really put it on stage, but 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 the but no, film get, the film the film gets you. Put it on stage because on stage you have yeah, a white shirt, yeah, yeah, and you would have yeah. been. Both yeah, I, I, I was about to say that you don't you lose the eye contact, yeah. but in the film you get that wonderful eye contact and the subtlety of it because the actor who plays the interrogator is a subtle is a subtle performer too. Yeah. Very int very interesting. Um, you know, this emotional journey from a tough interrogation officer who didn't want to know, who was a fellerman, who is confronted with such an honest character that sits one and a half meters away looking in your eyes, telling you about conscience, about moral, about injustice, about empathy, you know, to be confronted with such an honest girl, a uh, young woman, it's unbelievable. You know, and um, I'm so glad that we found this actor. He uh, was also a very uh, uh, an actor in The Downfall, yes. and Steven Spielberg chose him for Schindler's List. Right. He had 14 days of shooting in, in Steven Spielberg's movie, and he's he's not so well known in Germany, but now he's a big star. And um, it's a very subtle way. In, uh, in, you know, the, in, in in the original time, the first interrogation we called it Innocence was lasted five hours. And she could lie. She lied to him for five hours. And after five hours, oh, five hours eye contact. And you know, you put the leaflets there. And you pretend, I didn't put them there. You, you, know, you, you know your life is at stake. And then you lie five hours to a tough interrogation specialist. And I said, that's unbelievable. Unbelievable. And, you know, and, and of, he's observing and everything, you know. And try to, to, to have a 15-page scene always looking into the eyes, you know. Yeah. So, and, and it's not the words, so also um, uh, around the world, the story of Sophie Scholl and the performing of Julia Jensch touches the heart around the world because it's not always a matter of words. You know, it's a look into the eyes, and that's an unbelievable uh, event in this movie, I think. What is the aftermath, the immediate aftermath of the White Rose before, before the Americans, uh, they're executed about two years, a little, little more than two years before the Americans and the British finally invade. What's the immediate aftermath? Did it have any after effect? Was there, what was the protest after the death of the White Rose people? Um, I think nothing in the beginning. Um, in the 50s, it was like Marlene Dietrich. You know, I admire Marlene Dietrich also very much. She, she left the country. She went to America. She went to the troops in the, in, the, in the World War to motivate the American troops to defeat Germany, you know. And when Marlene Dietrich came back in the 60s, there were still people who shouted, Betrayer and you're a traitor. They were insulting Marlene Dietrich. And um, that's somehow the same in the 50s and 60s. Um, the members of the White Rose were seen as betrayers or traitors, not in a positive way. And when Michael uh, Michael Verhoeven shot his movie The White Rose in 81, the government tried to stop him. They said, don't dig in the past. Now it's the people in the foreign countries almost forgot the Nazi stuff. Now we are the Germans, not only the Nazis anymore. Don't dig in the past. They didn't give him money. You know? But he said, it's an important movie and I will shoot this movie. So it was a very political movie. Um, and complaining that the um, sentences of the People's Court, inclusive the death sentences against Sophie Scholl and the White Rose in 81, were still legal. They were still legal in 81. It took the Germans until 85, four more years, until they, they said these sentences of this terrible Nazi People's Court were crimes, were criminal. Another four years. So it was a scandal in Germany. And it was very difficult to, 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 to finance it for him. He had to shoot it in Budapest. And one generation later, for me, I, they gave me money. I wanted to make a, a digital a, a dogma style. And they said, Mark, no, you have to make a feature film. Here's the money. Here's the money. So you see how much changed from the last generation to nowadays. 
and um, that's also the like the the view of the German people on the white rose. In the 50s, 60s, it was not of interest, but in the 80s, 90s, they start to get real uh, heroines, you know, where you see these were strong people, and. Um, Churchill, for example, you know, there's a, a, a very famous quotation of Churchill. He said, this young passive resistance of these young students were the undestroyable fundament of the German rebuilding. You know, because the knowledge that there were resistance fighters or students, that made the Allies having the trust to give the power back to the Germans to rebuild their country, um, I think, from 44. 46, 48, 49 was the, the uh, we, we had the new Germany. You know, so they gave the responsibility back to the Germans after what the German people did. Not all of them, but the, the, the Nazis. You know, 50 million dead people, 6 million dead Jews. You know, but the responsibility to, 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 to rebuild Germany was given back very, uh, very early because of the knowledge of the people like the White Rose. That was what Churchill said. You know. How important has reunification been to spreading the, the, the sense of the, oh, the White Rose resistance, and how an effect has that had on Germany? Because I know it's been a big effect uh, financially and in, in every other way. But is reunification with the East and West are back together again? What what what, what effect has the White Rose had in, in East Germany, for example, where, where, where the history went off in a different direction? Um, not a very big one, because. Um, Normally, all the Gestapo headquarters destroyed all interrogation reports. But these documents, these reports of the White Rose uh, 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 interrogations were sent to the People's Court in Berlin that the judge can prepare the show trial. And when the Russians conquered Berlin, they found these documents. They sent it to Moscow. They checked it. They sent all these documents to the to East Berlin, to the East German part, uh, to East Germany, the communist system. They were reading the reports freedom of speech, freedom of religious, every human life is sacred, students, passive resistance, and they were hiding them because they said that it's not good for our communist system, they were hiding them. And um, to the time of the unification, all the documents came from the East German archive to the German archive. And um, of course the people were so busy with the fa end of the Cold War, with the fall of the wall, with growing together, they were interested in their own interrogation reports of the Stasi, of the East German time, so that nobody was interested in the, uh, in the documents of the East German archive ab about the time of the Second World War. So that was the reason why they were lying there since 1990, until for 13 years, until I called there, do you have documents? Yes. Can I see them? Yes. Can I have a copy? Yes. Cost one euro. I w they were never published. Nobody, no, nobody was interested in them, so I was the first who really read these documents and made a movie about it. Uh, about it. So um, in, the, in, the, in the East Germany, it was not a big thing. Nowadays, we have 190 schools named after Sophie Scholl, 190 schools, several hundred more named after other members of the White Rose. But in the East German part, in the unification, it was not a big deal. They were uh, busy with their present thing. How many? Uh, how large was the White Rose ultimately, and what, what was the fate of all the White Rose members? Were they all captured and executed, or did anyone get away? Um, the White Rose stands for young students at the university in Munich. It's an original location where we shot, and they were about uh, the, the 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 inner circle were about ten people, mostly men and the teachers. Also, the teachers helped the young students to write the leaflets. You know. And um, altogether, there were executed six people, and 14 other were sentenced to, uh, to, to prison, to sent, uh, were sent, sent to prison. So um, the death sentences was the teacher, Professor Huber, the teacher, the only woman, Sophie Scholl, and then the four friends, the brother Hans Scholl, Alexander Schmorell, Willi Graf, Christoph Probst. These were the six, six people who got executed, one teacher, one woman, and the four friends. And... Um, in the first show trial, they sentenced Hans and Sophie Scholl to death and their friend, the father of three children with 23 years, Christoph Probst. And that through their courageous performing in the show trial for trying not to discuss with the judge. No, they wanted to make the audience in their back think when they were discussing with the judge, fighting for humanity, fighting for the 
uh, uh, for the idea that there is no more final victory possible for military reasons. They are too strong, you know. We have to stop the war. They were not trying to convince the judge. They wanted to make the audience think. And in the second trial, because in the population, many people thought ah, that that sentence against Sophie Scholl, she, who was not writing, even, not even writing the leaflets, only dis distributing, was too harsh. That means, I think even Hitler gave the order to the judge, you are only allowed to sentence to death the people who were, ri who, who, who were writing the leaflets. So that was Willy Graf, Schmorell, and the professor. And the other ten, there were 13 people in the second show trial in front of the judge. The other ten, all between 18 and 22 years old, were sentenced to prison. And if you now, nowadays travel to, to, to Germany, in the university, the original location, there is uh, the White Rose Museum. And there are still living members of the second trial, of the third trial, who lead you through the university and tell you the story. So they were all about 20 students um, from this university. But they had contact to the Red Chapel in Berlin and, and to other small resistance fighters. And there were for sure also more resistance fighters. But dictatorships like this, if they find resistance groups, they kill them. And they really try to make to keep it secret, uh, of course, that it doesn't get popular. You know. Why do you think it popped up here and uh, popped up in Munich? Uh, why was that? Why do you think that was the case? What the well, show why, trial? Why it popped up? Why why did the white rose pop up in Munich? Is there any particular thing you think of? Um, no, I, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I think there was in Berlin. There were also some other. Uh, resistance fighters, but they didn't get so popular. So, for example, the the White Rose, they were the only resistance group that was really fighting for the life of the Jews. That's it's a proof in the in the in the in the in the leaflets. All others were fighting against Hitler or something, but they were fighting against uh, uh, for the for the life of the Jews. You know, and um, you know Sophie Scholl, and they they didn't come from 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 uh, Munich. They came from Ulm. It's a little village. And all, uh, one guy came from Austria to study there. But they were all studying philosophy. And I think they had very free spirit teachers. They, so the teachers tried to educate in a very subtle way. In a, uh, in a, to, to, they tried to educate the students against, to, to fight against, resist against Hitler in a very subtle way, in between the lines. So it, I think it was a mixture that there were uh, teachers who were against Hitler and um, from around the area, the people went to Munich to study philosophy, you know, and to people who, who study philosophy, they think about injustice and justice. They think about uh, uh, law and moral and conscience. So I think there was um, the people who were open-minded for resisting, who had the civil courage. They found together in this course of philosophy. I think in other universities, it was they were not so famous. They were so famous because they got killed so fast in this age for fighting with the word, you know. Um, and they were not political. They were uh, not political in, uh, concerning left or right wing or Protestant or Catholic. No, they were it's all different, but combined in the fight for freedom, the fight for justice, the fight against injustice, against murderers. What do you think, uh, because we now know that Austria has, has been a bit of a harder case in terms of ultimate denazification and everything, I mean, the ultimate joke about our governor, you know, and his father and everything, and that the Austrians were more Nazi than, than the Germans. What ultimately has been the effect on the German democracy? What makes the German democracy special, do you think? What characteristics of it, both on paper and in practice, uh, have made the German democracy special in the 50 years that you can look at? Um, um, you know, I was in Japan, and in Japan they want to forget the war crimes against China, about the, against the Koreans, about the Americans. They want to forget. Um, I told them victims don't forget, but it's an island, you know, and Germany is in the heart of Europe. You have so many different countries around Germany. They all suffered from Germany, you know, and with this terrible past what the Nazis did, not on the majority of the Germans. You know, I'm born 68. I don't feel guilt. I cannot feel guilt. I'm born 68. But I feel the responsibility to, to, to that this what, this, what happened there, never forget. You will, in Germany, you, you only can learn from the past for the future. I don't feel guilt, but I feel the responsibility. And I ask Michael Verhoeven, whether it's okay that I do the ongoing story 
of Sophie Scholl because his movie ends with the arrest. I said, I found new documents. And I said, Mark, please shoot this movie. And let's hope together that also the next generations will make their own movies for their own generation. That you don't forget it. When I travel through Germany, I ask who did see the movie The White Rose from Michael Verhoeven. It's half of the teacher who say, I saw it. You know, the young generation, it's a movie from 81, you know. So uh, every generation has to do their own movies about this time. From the, you have to learn from the past for the future. And we really, I think in Germany, um, we feel the responsibility. And this is also the reason why we didn't join the war. There was not enough proof. And before Germany sent some soldiers somewhere, you know, going back to war as the, with the past of this country, you really have to have strong proofs. You know, and I think um, this is an effect for sure um, that we didn't go to war, where I'm very proud of. You know, I've had the occasion of talking to it appears to be a new generation of young German actors. I've talked to the men so far: Daniel Bruhl, mm. Robert Stadlober, uh, Hannah Kaufler, uh, who were in Summer Storm, uh, and uh, of course, uh, oh. Good Goodbye Lenin. Uh, excellent movies. There seems to be a newly politicized generation of young actors, including very ambitious actors like mm. Daniel Bruhl, who is going to be an international star. Um, talk a little bit about that generation, because you're working with some of this. It, it, it seems like there's, a bun there's an abundance of talent and passion and, and some political consciousness, too. Um, you know, we are, we are a big country. We have now 80 million people. And for me, it's always interesting because through this terrible Nazi time, we lost two generations of artists, scientists, and filmmakers. Whether they got killed or they left the country, Billy Wilder, Lubitsch, or the, 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 the great filmmakers who could educate the next generation to make movies or to educate good actors. You know, Marlene Dietrich went to America. So we lost two generations. And Germany was, after the Second World War, totally destroyed, you know. And we saw many American movies, of course, screened by the Allies. And it took until the 70s, I think, till we so slowly rebuilt also a new generation of filmmakers. And um, in the 60s, we had somehow only 90% were feel-good movies on a very superficial way. Then we had in the 80s the Tin Drum and, and, and the first political movies like The White Rose. Then we started making comedies. In the 90s, we, we started making even thriller, you know. And nowadays, 2006, there's a huge diversity now going on because the developing after the end of war, now back to a second generation, now we do uh, action movies, we do thrillers, we do comedies, we do dramas, you know. And, of course, this um, rebuilding generations and filmmaker, uh, of filmmakers, of actors, um, also has a consequence that we uh, have more actors. You know, we, we, uh, 20 years ago we had two film schools. Now we have six. You know? So we're really still building up our uh, uh, knowledge and our creativity that we lost in two generations in the Second World War time. Yeah, I, I wrote in my comment on Love and, uh, Love and Thoughts, a movie that Daniel's in, uh, that this is a passionate movie that it's about a 1927 suicide club and everything. It's a passionate movie that shows a German cinema that could have been a rival to Hollywood. And who knows, may someday be again. But it's something about the German culture and the passion of it and the filmmaking that makes it a, 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 like China. Like China, like some of the Latin American countries, makes it a possible rival to Hollywood when you think that that is impossible. Um, you know, I think um, emotions and suspense and tears and love and this is international you know i i wouldn't say german french of course there are some art house movies or if you have if you deal about their own story but let's let's take run lola run you know a big hit around the world or goodbye lenin the story of a young boy that fights for the life of his mother you know the german background is of course then it's a funny thing to pretend um, uh, we are still in East Germany, there, this, the, there is still the war. But the message, the, the pitch is, a young fights for the life of the mother, you know. And in Sophie Scholl, it's a young woman fights against injustice, you know, f full of empathy and curiosity, f fight for the freedom, fight against injustice. That's also an international topic. So um, I think, you know, it's, I don't know whether it's a globalization or something, but... Um, you know, we, 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 we see so many American movies, French movies, and we learn from each other, you know, we learn from each other, but I think 
the, the, the most important topics in a movie, emotions, suspense, dramatic needs, hope, that's all, uh, it's international, you know, and I, I, I'm proud of, of, of Germany that, that um, we were able to rebuild uh, new filmmakers and actors after these terrible movies we had in the 60s and 70s, you know. Well, you know, it's funny because I'm a big fan of uh, Fassbender, you know, and I remember my friends and I going to see Berlin Alexanderplatz at the Castro. They played it th uh, five nights and plus a marathon on the weekends, but each night we went and saw a three-hour installment of Berlin Alexanderplatz at the Castro, and it was nearly mm -hmm. full. And the passion of and that, that's a film that's almost unseen because of the, the length of it and the fact that it was originally made for television. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, the brilliance of that, that it could, uh, I still, there are scenes from that that 23 years later I still remember and can quote back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you talk about the passion of, an, of, a, of a filmmaking culture that in another language can grab you that, that strongly. Um, he was extraordinary, you know, in the 70s when he, he, he died uh, in my age, you know, when he was 36 he died, so, but he did 40 movies, you know, and uh, he was in the time of Wenders and uh, Herzog and Schlöndorf, but there were not many more, that's about, I tell you, about four or five people. Now, the directors, uh, we have 10, 20 that are really great directors and uh, of course, you know, in this time, he was also the children time of the post-war time, you know, he was, uh, the, 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 the parents were in the, in the Second World War time and he had a lot to tell about this conservative Germans, you know, um, he, and I, I love his movies because he was fighting so passionate, um, not to, uh, he was fighting so passionate to learn from the past for the future. He was criticizing that things that may be uh, going on, remembering the Nazi time, you know, to, to be against the foreign people, to, to be against black people, you know, to, to provoke the, popula the, the, the audience to discuss, you know. No, he was great. He is, he's one, I think he was one of the greatest in Germany. But um, there were few, you know. And, and, of course, he did not a real comedy or action or... Or, you know, he did tough, important dramas to provoke, to let's discuss. And not all the movies were great, but when he, uh, I know the story, he was in Cannes, and he had the premiere in the beginning, and the people didn't like the movie. So it was a disaster. And he went back with the car to Munich to the editing room. He knew Cannes is about 10 days, and he had another movie in the editing room. And he was editing one or two or three nights, returning for the end of the Cannes Film Fest with another movie. Screened this new movie, and that was a huge success. So he was a really crazy guy um, fighting for, also for, for, for empathy, for justice. And, but he, he was really provoking, and he was mo making movie in a really, in a time where still many Nazis... Uh, were in very uh, important uh, uh, political or or uh, justice positions, you know. So there was still re really a reason to make movies fighting against uh, cons uh, not conservative about against Nazi people. Yeah, still. Uh, remind me of the name. The guy who did the day before tomorrow uh, ger as a German uh, national, right? Uh, he's Emily. Emily. Yeah, yeah. Just, I, I, I was in his house. So he wasn't around, but it was a big party for Summer Storm, and I was talking to Robert at that point. And Robert's very, uh, just like Daniel, he's very bilingual. I mean, they could both they'd both be in American films. And I was just talking about, you know, you hear German stars who are so good that they could go run off to Hollywood, mm -hmm. and they, it could work, just like Horst Buckles did for a while. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you, you wonder about that. Do you have a commitment to your own national cinema, to a European cinema, or do or, or to whatever Hollywood can do? Um, I'm totally open-minded. You know, I travel with the movie Sophie Scholl. I travel through uh, America. I was Minneapolis, Wisconsin, A5 Film Fest, Hamptons. We won the Audience Award. Uh, now in San Francisco, we were in Korea. We were in China. And um, I think it's... I'm not at all committed to Germany because the audience, I make the movie for audience, you know, I give this interview because for me it's important, I fight for every single spectator who goes into the movie, whether I give an interview in Germany or in Korea, you know, I fight for the audience to, uh, to, to get, uh, uh, that the audience goes into this movie and that I, I do Q&As around the world and I don't make the difference between Korea, America or Germany, you know, for me there's the audience, you know, and this is what I do the movies make for, you know. And um, 
if somebody calls from from if there's a good, good script in Greenland or Iceland, I go to there to make a movie, you know. And if there's a good script in America, then I improve my English a bit more, and then I I I, I would do it here. And I'm sure also Julia Jensch because we are open-minded. We like adventures. We know um, uh, uh, emotions are around the world, you know. And no, we are totally open-minded, and we would would move immediately if there's a script or a, or an idea that inspires and and touches us. Have you, in your travels, gotten any feedback from German Americans? There's a huge German American population in this country. It's one of the found major, like Scandinavian and British and French. Uh, I know there there have actually been a few German American films made uh, in with in by in both in both languages. Any feedback from that community? Um, I got a lot of feedback, especially when I was in uh, in L.A. The first screening, there were many Germans, of course. I was in Midwest, in Wisconsin, in Minneapolis, where it's a huge uh, uh, German community since generations. Also in England. But the feedback I got that they loved the movie and they would they recommend the movie to everybody because what I learned, what was very interesting, ninety-five uh, percent of the whole population on this planet thinks that all Germans were Nazis and all Nazis were murderers. Nobody knows about German resistance. Nobody knows about the White Rose. That means um, I met a, a, a young, a, a older German lady yesterday. She says sometimes they still call her a Nazi. I was in England. Uh, there, were, there were Germans living since 40 years. They, they hated Hitler. They went to England because they hated Hitler and they insult them still as Nazis. Because in the, in the schools... They still teach na uh, the Nazi time, and it's it's difficult to teach the whole story story of the Nazi time. But they don't teach the few resistance people. They don't they don't teach it. Uh, in America, I see sometimes in uh, uh, docu documentaries about still the Goebbels documentaries. You know, it's it's no, there's no comment. It's uh, Hitler dr dr driving through mass of people, children saying Heil Hitler, women tearing li like groupies to Hitler, but it's the propaganda of Goebbels, you know, and it still works. If the people nowadays see it, the, it, the pro propaganda still works, and they think every, all Germany is doing saying Heil Hitler, you know, and this is really, that is my feedback, that many people, especially the people who live abroad and who, who hate Hitler, uh, are still insulted as Nazis because everybody, nobody thinks or believes that there was German resistance, and that's why they say this is such an important movie. You know, in America, they said I will recommend the movie uh, to all everybody. You know, and I thought, oh, do they want to learn something about German history? I don't know. And they said no, just to see, to show my children or my friends, to just to show them a true story of a young woman that stood up for her right full of empathy, curiosity, fight against injustice. And that's international. They don't recommend Sophie Scholl to learn something about Germany. No, just to see the true story of such a character who stand up for the right. I think one of the curious things, just to, as you were talking, it occurred to me, one of the curious things that's happened about the Nazi legacy is the comedic use of it. Mel Brooks and the producers, Billy Wilder and One, Two, Three, but even uh, 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 an Australian filmmaker like uh, John Dugan, he has, a, he has a movie with Noah Taylor called Flirting <clears throat> that, has Nazi, that has Nazi comedy in it. You know, the sadistic headmaster who beats the boys is seen as a Nazi, you know. Um, ironically, later, Noah Taylor goes on to play the Young Hitler and, and Max, uh, but even in a Columbine movie, Gus Van Sant does a Columbine movie, and one of the boys watching before they go to kill their schoolmates are watching Nazi Nazi uh, documentary on television. It's like it's like a comedic subtext that's in the modern world that people don't even examine anymore. It's just a, you, you bring Hitler up, and it becomes a, a, a context for comedy in some ways. A satiric context. Um. No, that's, I, I, I don't share your opinion because I think maybe some free spirits can, in a very intelligent way, make fun about this stupid Hitler guy. But you never lose the sadness what he did. On the other side, there are still many people, and this is another feedback I learned. You have Nazis in America, in England, in Italy, around the world, in South America. There are still Nazis. And not too little. I heard about two blonde chicks, 20 year old, with a Hitler smiley, singing songs here in America. And I think um, so. 
intelligent people can make intelligent comedies about Hitler, not forgetting the sadness behind, but there are still too many Nazis who uh, are too serious fans of, of, of Hitler, you know, so I think that's, that's too ambiguous, you know, there are, uh, it's not only comedies, you know, so... Yeah, in Germany, you know, in Germany, uh, Tindrum was always, uh, also had some comic relief about it. You know, I don't know whether real Germans should are st are already that far that they could make comedies. Now, Danny Levy, who did uh, Go for Zucker, a Jewish German, he is now doing the first Hitler comedy, and he, the the the, the most famous German comedian, Helge Schneider. In a, uh, he plays Hitler, so everybody is very excited about this. But I'm very glad that a German Jew is doing this and not a German. So I think a, a comedy about Hitler for a German it t could take some more time to do it. Well, it was curious to me when I saw Goodbye Lenin and I, and I talked to Daniel Bruhl and the director of, of, of it that in some respects it was like a follow-up film to One Two Three, Billy Wilder's savage Cold War satire, which is which is filled with not with Nazi-like satire, but it's about the Cold War. You know, and Coca-Cola he takes it takes the Russians, the Americans, and the Germans in, involved in it. But that's Billy Wilder. Wilder has a, still has a unique, lasting legacy. I mean, he he came back to Germany because of his own feelings. His mother died in the concentration camp. And he had a particular thing he wanted to do. Also, for Ernst Lubitsch and Billy Wilder, for me, are one of the best directors of all times, you know. And they were, I, I, you know, they also did so different movies, you know, some like a Todd or, or to have or not a, to have the apartment. I, I know all the movies. I love them so much, you know. So no, they are the, Billy Wilder. They are. They, they are the best, you know. So I, but I, I love so many movies. I like uh, for Frank Capra. I like you know Todd Solange nowadays. You know the Todd Solange movies and um, uh, no, I forgot the question. But I, I, I admire them. Of course, you know. All, uh, you know, um, I'm such a big fan. I know um, all the documentaries also about Billy Wilder, and and I know that he had a, a over his table in his office. How would Lubitsch have done it? You know, I, I I always ask me how would Billy Wilder have done it? You know, not that I really know it then, but to think about it is always good. You know. Yeah, I think uh, the apartment was my. I started watching that when I was 15 years old, and later investigating, it, realizing it was based on I think on a German idea. It was based on a lot of the things he did were later based were based on German stories. That he, of course, if he had been able to stay in Germany, might have made his German films. But later, he would hold on to these ideas for 20 or 30 years, and later make a film about them. And it was just it, it just one little notion of what, what did the man feel who let his bed out feel? <laughs> what was what was his story? <laughs> that that kind of thing. Um, anyway, uh, how did you get started as a filmmaker? If I, you know, your own, per where do you come from in Germany, and wh how did you get started? Um, my grandfather was a soldier, and I think he was a Nazi too. But in the Nuremberg trials, he was a witness um, against the Nazis. So he told the Americans, the Allies, who were really the bad guys, and then he became a f uh, film producer. And my father is a famous TV director, and my parents divorced very early. And the only time when I could see my father was that I spent my school holidays on location where my father was shooting a movie. From a one-year-old baby, I in the, in, in the, in the, until I was 18 in my school holidays, and I was I was helping on location, and I learned um, the handwork, and I learned the wonderful thing about a passionate teamwork that 50 or 100 people passionate people try to bring up a script alive and that always really fascinates me you know the teamwork that many creative people and ahead of the direct and the director who combines all the energies and he creates an atmosphere and then uh, I refused to go to a film school and I started as a driver um, I heard a lot of t directors talking or actors complaining in my car. I learned a lot. Then I was a script girl. I was unit manager, production manager, second AD. And I was first AD to, let's say, also the Oscar-nominated movie uh, uh, Farinelli. I was assistant director also to international productions. And altogether, from the driver to the director, it took me eight years. And then I started uh, directing TV, uh, two 
TV serials, then I did two TV movies, and then I did my first TV uh, feature film, a comedy. Um, then I did a feature film teenage comedy, then I did two TV dramas, and now I did my first feature drama, Sophie Scholl. It's, it's great, but you working your way up there is a be, is a great experience yes. because it's a long way. But yeah, it's great. I mean Billy Wilder and his friends were making movies. Uh, one of them was at the festival. People on Sunday. He was a scriptwriter for that. There's an amazing number of famous collaborators who did this basically student film, which yeah. which has survived. What? How is German cinema? Final question. How is German cinema going these days? You talk about all the diversity of it. Well, what what directions are are most promising for you? Um. Sophie Scholl was the most successful drama this year. Um, there was Till Schweiger uh, directed a comedy. Um, we have, I think, nine movies that are that did more than one million admissions. That's very, uh, very much. So, um, and I know very good movies that are now in the pre-production and. They are from very different genres, and I think that's a very interesting thing, to see dramas or to see it, art house movies and to see comedies. Um, but the problem is that we have a percentage, only 50% of the German people go into, the, into German movies. And that's, it's very tough to get German audience into the German drama. They always prefer American movies and American dramas. And it's very difficult to bring the German audience into the German movies. So, Why is that? What, what is that? No, because after the end of war, there were not good movies. The filmmakers, there were no more filmmakers. The people got used to see American movies. Um, uh, we have 80% uh, of all the movies uh, are from America. So it, it, and there were no Amer German movies after the end of war, you know. And um, to first you have to build up f uh, a new filmmakers and new actors. To, to to make an offer to the to the German audience, you know, in the 50s, 60s, there were uh, there was always no film industry, so it takes some time, you know. If you lose two generations of filmmakers, you won't build it, rebuild it in 50 years. It, but we are on a good way. We are on a good way. Well, thank you very much. I enjoyed the film tremendously. It was just wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you for the technical setup, <laughs> being my crew today. <laughs> it's like,